Hey, it's Kay. And this is Skittles, my executive producer. Today we're going to talk about the new bad boys of British politics. That's right, it's those centrist heartthrobs, the independent group. Recently, Chuka Umuna, the leader, uh, no, sorry, spokesman for the independent group, released a party manifesto. No, no, sorry, not a manifesto, just a casual list that he personally wrote that happens to detail policies on many key areas a party would be expected to address. Totally different. But we'll come back to that totally not a manifesto later. First of all, let's take a look at what the independent group officially stands for. Which is, uh... All we can do is direct you to our website. Uh... We got anti-Brexit and anti-racism. Okay. Okay, well, that's something. We can work with that. It's not just about colour. I mean, you know, the recent history of the party I've just left suggests that it's not just about being black or a funny... You know... So we got anti-Brexit. Okay. Let's do some investigation here and find out what these people actually stand for other than that. Let's start looking at the voting record of the 11 MPs who defected from their parties to form this new party. Oh, wait, no, this, this isn't actually a party. The independent group isn't registered as a political party and so is not subject to electoral law requiring them to do things like disclose their financial backers. Cool. Okay. One of the big things the independent group promises is a new politics. So, let's have a look at how they voted on some of the most shameful foreign policy decisions the country has made in the 21st century. Surely these rational free thinkers who are bringing us a new, better politics, uh, surely they were on the right side of history in these instances at least. The Iraq War. Every MP who was in power at the time voted in favor of it. The Libya no-fly zone. Every MP who was in power at the time voted in favor of it. Airstrikes in Syria. Every MP voted in favor of it except Mike Gapes, who was absent, and Gavin Shooker, who, to his credit, wins the dubious honor of the only no vote on the topic of British imperialism that these 11 MPs have made between them. Oh, and they were all either absent or supportive when it came to Afghanistan as well. You know, Afghanistan. That thing we're still doing. So that's a really ugly voting record, but fortunately, these are all responsible, rational people who we can trust to let their constituents hold them accountable for their decisions. And we know that because they say this on their website. We believe that our parliamentary democracy, in which our elected representatives deliberate, decide and provide leadership, held accountable by their whole electorate, is the best system of representing the views of the British people. And they mean it. You can tell because, aside from an absent Sarah Wollaston, every single one of these MPs voted against investigation into the Iraq War. Even after the Chilcot report was released, showing that Blair and co. collaborated to misinform Parliament and the public in order to justify the war. One of our new independent group MPs, Joan Ryan, had this to say during a 2016 debate in which she voted against the investigation. On my reading of Chilcot, it says there was no falsification or an improper use of intelligence. There was no misleading of cabinet and no secret commitment to war. I've linked the Chilcot report below and I welcome you to read it for yourself. I've also linked to a Guardian article that runs down some of the key highlights of the Chilcot report, which include... The UK chose to join the invasion before peaceful options had been exhausted. Blair deliberately exaggerated the threat posed by Blair Saddam Hussein. Blair promised George Bush, I will be with you, whatever. The decision to invade was made in unsatisfactory George Bush largely ignored UK advice There was no imminent planning. threat from Saddam. Britain's intelligence agencies The UK military were ill-equipped. The, the government had no Blair ignored warning about what relations happened in Iraq. The UK had no influence on Iraq state out of the UK did not achieve its objectives The government did not try hard enough to keep a tally of Iraqi civilian casualties. The report explicitly states exactly the things Joan claims it doesn't. In other words, she is lying. However, you'll notice she cleverly framed this statement as 
her reading of the report? A good move if you wanted to avoid repercussions for lying to Parliament, hypothetically speaking. Perhaps because it would be against her own best interest if the Iraq war that she supported was investigated further. A lie in defense of imperialism or a lie in defense of her own behavior leading up to the war. I'll let the folks at home ponder that one over. Both the Conservative and Labour MPs in the Independent Group have fairly consistently voted along their respective party lines on benefits, education, and taxes, although the Labour MPs would occasionally side with the Conservatives, such as on education, where several of them have voted to raise tuition fees, and Angela Smith was one of the few Labour MPs still opposing nationalizing our water. You know, that necessity. Between her, the lukewarm support of the other MPs for these more left-wing policies, and the handful of Tory MPs, it's unlikely the independent group would present a meaningful opposition to further privatization. I've linked each one of their voting records below in the description, so feel free to have a little root around for yourself. Based on Chuka's Not a Manifesto, however, it's beginning to look like the ex-Labour MPs' votes in favour of renationalizing public services, or opposing benefit cuts may have just been towing the party line. More on that in a minute. The Labour MPs, who have defected for this new centrist party, are generally proponents of the more centre-left Blair-era Labour Party, and upon their exit made it no secret that they were completely against the left-wing shift in the party, as well as attacking Labour for its anti-Semitism, which is pretty rich coming from people happy to collaborate with MPs from the Conservative Party. A party whose foreign secretary has been advised by Steve Bannon. A party who actively defended the Hungarian Orban government that is widely known for its far-right anti-Semitism. And appointed Roger Scruton, known anti-Semite and Orban fan, as the chair of their housing and architecture committee. But nah, I'm, I'm sure they have a very sincere commitment to opposing anti-Semitism and all racism, surely. And this has nothing to do with slandering their left-wing political opponents. After all, these guys are non-ideological, let's not forget. Ex-Labour Independent Group MP Gavin Shooker has previously suggested that the new group could replace the Brexit-backing DUP as the government's confidence and supply partners, but only in return for a softer Brexit. And that's an important piece of context to keep in mind when we look at Chuka's Not a Manifesto, which I've linked below, of course, so you can read it in full if you really want to watch a posh centrist wank himself off for 50 pages. No judgment here. In the excruciatingly long-winded preamble before Chuka gets to his actual policy positions, he repeatedly attacks Labour while being bizarrely gentle to the Conservatives and their voter base. Labour is a radical, far-left den of anti-Semitism and richest hatred. The Conservatives, however, are a fundamentally good party who have just been strong-armed by a few far-right bad apples. And Conservative voters, deep down, uh, they're good people who actually secretly support every policy Chuka details in his Not a Manifesto. I gotta admit, gaslighting the conservative voter base to try to convince them they don't really support all the things they vote for, it's a, it's a bold strategy. And I should note that, yeah, anti-Semitism exists in the Labour Party, like it sadly exists throughout British society and in every other political party. The Labour Party, for its flaws, actually has party policy against anti-Semitism specifically, whereas the Conservative Party that the Independent Group are so eager to collaborate with do not. And despite their claims that they had adopted the IHRA, which many Palestinian activist groups spoke out against, so that's something to think about, while attacking Labour last year for questioning some of the clauses, it was and still is not part of the Conservative Party Code of Conduct. The fact that anyone from or working with the Conservative Party thinks they can go around lecturing anybody about racism? Well...
It seems that the independent group offers different, non-ideological politics that mostly revolves around attacking the left and eagerly declaring your willingness to enter a coalition with the conservatives. A party that has been privatizing public services, killing thousands with austerity, bolstering British imperialism around the globe, all while aiding the rich in accumulating more profits than ever before. None of these things seem to bother the independent group, or at least not nearly as much as Labour wanting to renationalize public services that were built with public funds. Because even the slightest peak outside of the business ontology is immediately radical and dangerous. While even the most destructive tendencies of the right, well that's just the cost of doing business. As long as it doesn't jeopardize our trade agreements with other countries, of course. Starving disabled people to death is one thing, but irresponsibly pulling us out of a beneficial economic union? Those darn reactionaries have gone too far this time. But despite all these heavily ideological political allegiances, they still have the nerve to call themselves non-ideological, and not politics as usual. You know, I swear we've seen this before. An ideology that paints itself as something non-political in order to justify their policies as something inherently rational. Not like those ideologically driven madmen who want to not start a war that kills hundreds of thousands of people based on a transparent lie. The completely preventable poverty, death, and violence that the United Kingdom has been unleashing on the world? These are just normal, non-ideological things that are the natural state of humanity. This is just the way we do things. Wait. I'd know that stench anywhere. Maggie. It's you again. This non-ideological group of rational free thinkers seems to be hitting the exact same beats that neoliberal capitalists always have. They lean conservative, fully support capitalist interests, and try to sell it to you as a fact, not a value. It's not politics when it's capitalism. Now, you might be noticing a pattern here. Why do so-called centrists consistently side with the right and oppose the left with the same intensity that the right does? Shouldn't they be trying to, you know, find a compromise in the middle? Well, that's the thing. They do. However, you need to understand where the middle is to these people. Their middle is the middle of capitalism. Extremely lukewarm center-left politics fit into capitalism, and this is the maximum amount of left that the centrists will tolerate. Conservative politics also fit into capitalism. However, as I explain in my video The Function of Fascism, fascism is actually an aspect of capitalism as well. It is capitalism's self-defense mechanism when under threat from economic crisis and or organized worker resistance. This means that the reasonable left to a centrist is someone like Tony Blair, a bit of social security but still a goal of privatization and prioritizing business interests. And anything beyond that is just ridiculous. The right, however, can go much, much further and still conform to the business ontology of capitalism. This means that in the search for the center, centrists will invariably drag the Overton window to the right because the intensity of right-wing ideas that they're prepared to tolerate is dramatically greater than the intensity of left-wing ideas that they're willing to tolerate. Even the relatively lukewarm Sokdem reformist Jeremy Corbyn is indistinguishable from Stalin with a flamethrower arm to many of these people. Fascist ideologues like Richard Spencer, however, he's not interfering with the business ontology. Sure, he's bad, but let's at least hear him out. Free speech, innit? This brings us to something that increasingly people are becoming aware of. The real end of the left-right dichotomy that the independent group pretends to be the herald of. There is no true left or right because those terms don't really describe anything more than a vague set of values that can be moved around freely depending where people decide the center is. And quite often, the placement of that center is dependent on what the dominant ideology is at the time. So if you live under capitalism, what you might think of as the objective center is going to exist on the terms dictated within capitalism. See, there is no left and right. There is capitalism and there is socialism. Either the people control production, housing, and the functions of their society, or a handful of exceedingly rich people do. 
And if a handful of people control these things, there is nothing that can stop them from becoming exceedingly rich, because they have the power. No matter how friendly you imagine those exceedingly rich people, no matter how many cool free things they might give you, so long as those exceedingly rich people control every aspect of our government and economy, that can all be revoked. We are living at their mercy, even if at any given moment they are being merciful. It isn't sustainable, and it has historically not been working out for us at all. So when someone's definition of the center only allows for the left to be defined as nice rich people controlling our country, who ease the burden they put on us by exploiting our labor a bit gentler, and the right can be anything up to and including mass murder, extreme poverty, and super profits for people who are already so rich they couldn't spend all their money if they tried, where do you think that center is going to land? What level of crimes against humanity, for profit, will they be willing to tolerate if even their acceptable left tolerates plenty? This plays out in almost satirical fashion in Chuka's Not a Manifesto, in which he insists that politics is no longer playing out along traditional class lines. He uses a 3% swing towards conservatives amongst the low-paid, unemployed, and state pensioners, as well as a 4.5 swing towards labor among the middle and upper middle class, to explain this theory of his. Unfortunately, the fact that not every poor person votes in what you might think would be their own economic self-interest doesn't make class society stop mattering. This section of his Not a Manifesto is desperate to get you to stop thinking about class, to stop thinking about capitalism. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to think or what to do, but I believe that when a staunch defender of the status quo doesn't want you to look somewhere, that might be the place you want to look if you don't think the current status quo is particularly good. Centrists, like conservatives, like liberals, are all feeding into the neoliberal ideology. The position that the status quo is natural, and we can only deviate in the tiniest of margins from it, or else we're absurd radicals, and the status quo, I hate to break it to you, it's pretty ugly. So if this is the base from which you're finding your center, you are going to find yourself supporting some nasty shit, like the Iraq War. There's nothing non-ideological about that. Speaking of which, alleged Iraq War criminal Tony Blair happily sung the sales pitch of the independent group from the rooftops recently, saying that Labour and the Conservatives moving to the left and right have left all the reasonable centrist voters politically homeless. Which is strange, since the 2017 general election had the highest voter turnout in 20 years, and Labour's share of the votes increased by the most it had since 1945, despite being led, of course, by Joseph Stalin with a flamethrower arm. And gun eyes. The myth of the centrist masses dying for someone to come along and promise not to change anything, it has no basis in reality. Change has consistently been a powerful idea that has won many an election. Because, and I wouldn't expect an aging millionaire like Blair to understand this, most people don't like this. They don't like neoliberalism. They don't like living at the end of history where nothing can ever really change. They don't like reliving the same political cycle again and again. And they don't like helplessly waiting for the next crash. That's why fascism and socialism have been making a comeback. That's why Labour was dead in the water before Corbyn was elected leader. People are fleeing the centre in every direction, for better or worse. Socialism is gaining serious ground worldwide and in the UK, and the fact that the right wing of the Labour Party has been so afraid of the direction they're going that they've been sabotaging, slandering, and outright splitting from the party over the frankly minimal reforms the party intends to implement, that should tell you how scared the keepers of neoliberalism have been. People are in favor of these ideas. The country isn't going to collapse if we house people and take control of our transport networks. Pay close attention to the people who keep insisting it will. Speaking of, Chuka opposes renationalization entirely. Says it would be a waste of money. The privatization of publicly built services is, to him, and to neoliberalism, more reasonable than the efforts by labor to take back these assets that belong to the public to begin with. Renationalization is too radical for Chuka. Privatization, though, is fine. 
Oh, but it's okay because he wants to make the companies that buy up our public services, often at great cost to public funds, write the provision of public benefit into their constitution. That'll sort it. Chuka also thinks scrapping tuition fees would be a waste of money, despite having voted for it as a Labour MP. Unsurprisingly, without a party line to tow, all Chuka is free to shift to the right as much as he likes. A trend you'll see throughout his Nada Manifesto, and I expect we'll be seeing from the other ex-Labour MPs. On the topic of the NHS, which is being slowly but systematically disassembled and sold off to private contractors by the current government, he says nothing about returning this crucial service to the hands of the public that built it, but rather talks about creating new revenue streams for the NHS, and, under the current way of doing things, into the pockets of private contractors who own huge segments of our health service. The theme throughout Chuka's Not a Manifesto is superficial change. We're not going to actually fix the parasitic relationship that private healthcare and transport companies have with the British government and the British people. We're going to make them be nicer in their parasitism, or at least more innovative. But the conceit in this idea is that the parasitic relationship is fine. It just needs slight adjusting. Chuka is manufacturing consent for privatization. He is creating a narrative in which it is a given and we just need to discuss how to make it work for us. The fact that he used the word radical to refer to his policies in this document ten times is absolutely absurd. Oh, and by the way, despite thousands of deaths connected to benefit sanctions and widespread outcry about how the Tories are running the welfare system, Chuka doesn't detail any plan whatsoever for benefit reform. I guess that's not a concern for him. Not nearly as important as, uh bringing back national service. Oh wait, he says it's not military. Well, that's fine then. It's just using young people as cheap labor for private companies. Uh, which we already do, by the way, because if you're under 18, you get about half the minimum wage. Holy fuck, is that real? Nowhere is the independent group's trend of superficial change clearer than the Not a Manifesto's plan for reforming parliamentary debate. Chuka wants to abolish Prime Minister's questions as he feels it's making Parliament too tribal and adversarial. And his plan to remedy this and make us all one big happy family working together is, I shit you not, it's to move MPs to a horseshoe-shaped chamber. So, so they're not all on opposite sides from each other. I keep having to double check that this document isn't actually published by The Onion. This brings us to the second theme of this Not a Manifesto, calls for unity. We're too tribal and divided, and as we know, tribes are bad and we don't want to be like them, because the Brits just refuse to be self-aware about their colonial history. And what better way to demonstrate your commitment to unity and opposition to division than splitting from your party and, and forming your own? But hey, hypocrisy doesn't seem to be a big concern for these guys, so unity good, division bad, got it. I would humbly like to make a counterpoint. In the current system, this division is good. The Conservative Party has been condemned by the UN for their treatment of disabled people. That includes myself and many people I care about. We are dying in the thousands. I have absolutely no interest in uniting with the people who support and implement these policies. I want to stop them. Likewise, the people who stand to profit from the privatization and selling off of our public services, they have no interest in uniting with people who want to keep them in public hands. The fact that we are divided on these sorts of issues means there are people in this country who give a shit about disabled people, who give a shit about protecting our public services, who give a shit about working class people and take seriously the bigotry that infects our communities. We should be seeking to convince people that these policies are harmful and win them over, not compromise with them at the cost of our communities, our safety, and even our lives. If man A wants to kill man B, and man B wants to not be killed, man C showing up and suggesting man A simply maim him, that isn't a compromise worth considering. And man B isn't unreasonable or divisive if he says, no, I don't... I don't want to be maimed. 
Or, if we're honest, it'd be more realistic at this point for Man C to say, okay, Man A can kill Man B, but he needs to use an environmentally friendly method of corpse disposal. That's right, Clegg. I haven't forgotten about that time you traded a fucking plastic bag tax for benefit cuts. The version of unity that Chuka and centrists like him are peddling always seems to consist of compromising with the right and telling the left that they're just being too divisive. That's not unity for marginalized people, that's suicide. So all this awful tribalism and division, that's our communities standing up for themselves and the people around us who support us. If you want unity, you need to stand with the most marginalized people in your society. You need to work with them to build an actual democracy, where people have control not just over who represents them, but their workplaces, their living spaces, and what is done with what they produce. When you're being starved out and exploited for the incredible profits of a few wealthy people, division is good. It means people want change. Real change, not the superficial change of moving around the seating in Parliament. Throughout history, whenever a land is conquered, the first thing their new rulers do is call for peace. Something to think about when wealthy men tell you that you're being too divisive when you stand up for yourself. We need to build communities based on our mutual needs, not on political power alone, and not on how you can be profitable. That is the path to unity. And you'll never achieve that by playing a game of moderation between vulnerable people and the people who keep them vulnerable. It's amazing how quickly stop being divisive begins to sound like stop resisting.